Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Keeping Relevant. My guest, Sophia Elijah, has devoted her work life to advancing civil rights and reforming the criminal justice system. She's been a practicing defense attorney, a teacher of law, the director of the Correctional Association, and in 2016, she started a new organization, the Alliance of Families for Justice, and she serves as the executive director, all with the greatest intelligence and untold energy. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> it is good to, for you to be back, and it's been too long a time, mm -hmm. I think, because you were last at the Correctional Association. That's right. So That's I missed right. all the founding of this great organization. But you're catching us at a good time. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> so what started your interest? I always like to find out how people got kind of directed to the things that they then spend a lifetime doing. Well, the issues that the Alliance of Families for Justice work on, and I should stop and say what our mission is. Stand. Okay. So our mission is to support, empower, and mobilize families who have incarcerated loved ones and people whose lives have been impacted by the incarceration system. That issue is one that impacts the community that I come from, that I grew up in and I still live in. And so it was very near and dear to my heart, but I never recognized it or foresaw it to be like my career. I went to school to be a doctor. Okay? <laughs> but on the way to the forum, I switched <laughs> um, majors and interests and decided I was going to be a criminal defense lawyer. Boy. And the rest is history, but at age 17, I took my first step into a maximum security prison in New York State, and that had a lifelong impact on me. I can just imagine. I remember the first time I visited a prison, and it was astonishing. Um, and I, I don't think anybody has, a, or most people do not have the faintest idea of what it's like. Correct. Correct. I mean, one overnight would be enough to make somebody never want to go back again. Well, just, just the processing that you go through as a visitor right. is humili humiliating, right. um, strips you of all your dignity, and you can't help but reflect on, if this is what's happening to visitors, what is happening to the people who are forced to spend the night there? Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. So why are we like this as a public a general population? You know, the American public has an addiction problem. We're addicted to punishment. Everybody thinks that they are ordained to sit in judgment and decide punishment and make the punishment as um, humiliating as possible um, to destroy people. It's, it's really, really a bad sickness that we suffer from, as opposed to, as a society saying, if someone's behavior um, was outside of the norms of acceptable conduct, then we as a society have failed. What have we failed to do as far as providing this person with the support so that they feel that they're a contributing member of society? Instead, we condemn the person. We don't look at the systems that we have forced them to navigate to oppress them in a variety of ways and decide that this individual has failed as opposed to we as a society have failed. But it's, it's such a complicated thing because the fear of crime is so manipulated and used mm -hmm. by so many people. I mean, uh, elected people, people, you know, the police. I mean, everybody partic participates in making it this great fear. It's a cheap narrative. Yeah. It's a cheap narrative and it has worked over but, and over and over again. So now what you've done though is you've taken that general topic mm -hmm. and brought it into a more local, realistic, existing state, right? Right. The, your organization is with people who are, have been incarcerated or parts of families where somebody is incarcerated. Right. So. How did you decide where to start it? And what's your theory that it comes from certain populous districts? Is that what happened? So what was happening, I would say maybe 20, 15 to 20 years ago, was slowly the American public was starting to look at the fact that the United States was the number one incarcerator in the world. Right. And that it held 25% of all the people who are incarcerated across the globe. That's pretty staggering. That's an amazing thing. Right. We have more people in prison than 
China, anybody. Right. right. With 2.3 million people incarcerated, but there was no dialogue about what were the collateral consequences of the the people who were doing time with the people who were incarcerated. So a number of measures and more narratives started um, to evolve about maybe we should have alternatives to incarceration. We should have more programming inside for people who are incarcerated. Maybe we should have um, more opportunities tied to the court still, but more opportunities so that people's lives wouldn't necessarily end up behind a cage or in a cage. But there was no dialogue about what about all the folks who are back home? Not just the children, because there was more growing narrative about the children, but what about the siblings, the aunties, the grandparents, the parents, the spouses, the partners, and the neighbors, and the girlfriends, and the boyfriends, and cousins. The whole family does time with the person who's sent to prison. And that whole family is traumatized by that experience. It's like the person who's incarcerated. It's not the same kind of humiliation, but they dovetail with each other. And when did we notice the percentage of the, the obvious racism, the percentage of black and Latina well, people? It's an interesting question when you say, when did we notice? The question is, who's the we? Black and brown people knew all Always along. Always knew. Right. Um, but, when did that come to the public well, you consciousness? Know, some researcher decided that, voila, they had just figured something out that a lot of people who look like me knew all along. That, for instance, in New York State, the prison population is about 80% black and Latino, about 65% black, about 15% Latino, and then the rest other and white. Now, it can't be that with the black population being no more than 13% of the overall New York state population, that there should be 65% of the prison population. And there's been numerous research studies that have shown that the incidence of criminal behavior is the same across all races. But who ends up in a cage and who doesn't is tied to racism. Is it, does it follow the kind of cycle we have in domestic violence that frequently victims of domestic violence go on to be batterers themselves? Mm, I don't know that I can, we can draw a bright line um, for that. It is true that the data that reflects the number of people who have been victims of uh, domestic violence falls far short of the actual numbers of people who, right. who've been subject to domestic violence. Um, I think maybe what we're getting at in the question is, is it true that people who've been harmed tend to harm? Um, there's, right. been, there's been research that has shown that that, in fact, is the case. And if you, if, if we as a society took the time to really talk to people who are incarcerated or have been incarcerated about what their life trajectory has been, many people have had very sad upbringings, navigated very traumatic experiences. Not because the people in their family who loved them didn't try, but I think people of more affluence can't begin to wrap their brains around what poverty, depression, oppression and racism, you put all that in a blender, what that means to never have an opportunity to, to even think that any of your dreams can come true, hmm. sooner or later, that's not going to work. Right, but when is it ever going to change? <laughs> people like us are going to make that change <laughs> and influence so. the people who are listening to us. <laughs> right? So tell me now about your program, okay. the, the Alliance. What kind of programs do you do? I mean, what do you do? So we have a number of different things that we do, and they've evolved over time since 2016, and I'll lay them out in no particular order. We have a family support unit, and that was actually our first unit, because most people came to the organization looking for help, either for their incarcerated loved one and or themselves to help them navigate what it meant to have someone that they loved incarcerated or to have someone that they love recently come home mm -hmm. and they don't know how to be emotionally supportive for that individual. Then we have a legal support unit and our legal support unit is the only place in town where 
family members can go and get free legal advice and representation to help them navigate the indignities and sometimes the denial of visitation, et cetera, um, when they're going to visit their loved ones. And the family support unit, excuse me, then the legal support unit also helps incarcerated people um, um, right. parole, yeah. um, clemency, denial of access to mental health or, or food or a transfer, a wide variety of things and punishment. Um, I know some people might say, but someone's already punished when they're in prison. That's true, but then there's other layers of punishment like solitary confinement, et cetera. So our legal support unit works with that. We have an organizing and advocacy unit, which is actually our newest unit, where we train family members, volunteers, formerly incarcerated people, um, in advocacy and organizing so that they can be on the front lines advocating for system change that they feel will improve the quality of their lives and the people that they love. And last but not least is our youth empowerment project that works with young people who are more on the margins. Our young people generally are not those folks who um, on the National Honor Society and who have been tapped for 24 different scholarships at um, Ivy League yeah. universities, but are the young people who are navigating the challenges of making it day to day in our society who otherwise might not ever see themselves as leaders or as being civically engaged. So those, that's our, our, I'll say our catchment. And you area. pay them. Oh yeah, we pro provide stipends to our yeah. youth empowerment participants. You have several issues that you really... Mm -hmm. We uh, have campaigns that we're working right, on. Right, that you favor. So Some one, yeah. yeah, one is shutting down Attica, closing Attica prison. That's a long one, right? Well, I'd like interest. to argue it's not going to take that long, but you know, sooner or later it's going to close. I, I like to say there's no question about whether Attica is going to fall. It's only when, when is it going to fall. And, and some might ask why Attica, and I'll come back to that in a okay. moment. So that's one of our campaigns is to shut down Attica. Another campaign is to restore the right to vote for people who are incarcerated. Do we not have that in New York? New York state constitution denies people who are serving time on a felony. For serving time. Serving time in a prison on a felony from voting. Okay. Now. With a lot of advocacy work, the laws have changed in New York so that people on parole can vote. No question that people who have a record can vote. Correct. However, Unlike there's Florida. no question about it, but a lot of people are unaware that, they think that the law has changed, so they assume that because they had a felony conviction, they are barred from voting in New York. So a lot of our work is about educating the public, particularly going not going to the areas where perhaps the League of Women Voters might find themselves, but areas where the police don't want to go, um, where areas that are um, ignored. We do education about civic engagement there so that we address low voter turnout, low voter registration, so that people become civically engaged and contribute to what's going to happen in their communities. And then our other campaign really focuses on all things that are happening with the Department of Corrections and Community Supervision. And there's a wide variety of issues. During the pandemic, and some like to say the pandemic's not over, and I'm not sure that it is, but just fighting to get access to masks and access to testing and then access to vaccinations and um, providing people with dignified medical care if they had COVID. People were afraid to report that they had COVID because what was happening to them is they were thrown in isolation with none of their belongings on a metal slab. Mm. So no one wants to try to heal under those circumstances. So we did a lot of advocacy around that. And terrible too, it's a lot of after effects. Have exactly. exactly. Um, and what about the packages, what is that? So the package policy, and I'm so glad that you asked about that. <laughs> New York, I'll say was unique in that it was one of the few places where family members and visitors could bring a care package to the prison when they came to visit. Now, they didn't deliver the package in the visiting room. Right. They had to leave it at the front desk so that guards could search through, Go through, it, through yeah. it. Right. And I'm one of these people who used yeah. to bring care packages to a prison. You could also mail a care package. And what was really special about this is it helped the person inside to know that folks on the outside 
loved them. And what you put in the care package was food items that were special. I, for years, I bought jelly beans for someone who had a, a jelly bean fetish. But there's a variety of things that various people want to receive as far as food items. So care packages were done that way. At a certain point a few years ago, the Department of Corrections and Community Supervision, which we call DOCS, changed the policy and said, you can't send care packages anymore. You can't bring them and you can't mail them. Right. That the only way a care package could go in is you had to order items online and then have them sent in. Through their system or can no, you, do, no, it's you from, could do it from uh, anybody? Well, initially when this policy was implemented, you could only go through approved vendors. We pushed back on that successfully and then they switched it up and said you could go through any vendor, all right, but you could not personally mail in or bring in a package anymore. Why is this particularly important? The, I use the word nutrition in quotation marks because what is served as far as food is hardly described as being nutritional. So many people are able to survive on the food that comes in their care package. So that includes perishables like fresh fruits and vegetables. And for people, I'm a vegan, so for people <laughs> who are, eat meat, those things they look forward to and survived off. So when you mail order any of those items, first you have to wait for the box to be shipped by the, um, the vendor. Then it gets to the package room and sits till everything rots. So people are spending twice and three times as much for these items that are never able to be consumed by their loved ones because they're rotting in the package room. When they, pass a when they issue a regulation, do they consult with anybody beforehand? Do they give anybody notice? They don't have to consult with anybody. They just have an arbitrary right to... DOCS has been given carte blanche to implement whatever policies they feel that they need to implement. And so the only thing advocates and family members can do is try to combine their voices and, and um, amplify to the rest of the general public what is happening and why it is important. Has anybody ever challenged it legislatively that there should be certain, you know, notice that a change in rules is being considered or so, public scrutiny, you know, that kind of thing? Well, you know, I'm a lawyer. Yeah. And as I used to teach my students, sometimes the law is a tool for social change and sometimes it gets in the way. And so <laughs> here's one of those times where it gets in the way. So. And I'd, forgive me, because there's two major cases and right now, because um, right. I haven't been practicing right. for a minute, I don't remember the names of them, but those cases basically decided that if a colorable argument could be made by the correction staff or administrators that the reason for the policy was tied to security, basically they had carte blanche to do whatever they wanted. End of discussion. So what's the security issue, that somebody's putting something in? Well, that that's what they'll argue. All right, and the, I will not say that it doesn't happen. <laughs> correct, but there's but we also know there's metal detectors, there's dogs that sniff for drugs, and there's human beings who are paid a salary to go through these packages yeah, right. and and pull out anything that shouldn't go right. in. Okay, but the package policy we've been fighting it for what almost two years now, um, but Docs is not budging. So you're the major source of talent, development, and information uh, for people who are incarcerated in the state, basically. We, we try mean, to be. On your website, you've got two big manuals. Mm -hmm. One is what, the Tomskin, Tomkins? Yeah, the toolkit for people for reentry. It's a reentry yeah. toolkit that it's was amazing. done. amazing. How many pages is it? Oh, I don't remember. It goes on and on, yeah. and you can read it. It's just online. Right. And the other is the jailhouse lawyers, right. which I love. Very important. Yeah. Very important tools for people. Right. There was something I read that you, you, you can be found early in the, at, late at night <laughs> where the buses are leaving, and that was particularly of interest to me because before the Coliseum at 59th Street, was, mm -hmm. that building was taken down. Right. The buses used to leave from there. What they called them, prison gap buses. Right. I've ridden them. Yeah. yeah. And so, I, but, my husband, who was a writer, mm -hmm. was fascinated because you would mix the crowds coming from Lincoln Center, <laughs> mm -hmm. all glittery, 
Right. And all these poor people who were standing for those buses on, in right. the middle of the night. So what happened, one of the things that changed during the pandemic, um, Ronnie, is docs um, terminated, I, mean, I shouldn't say terminated, suspended all visits. Right. So many companies, usually small entrepreneurs who had vans, maybe one van, maybe a couple of vans, some people had buses, those companies didn't have customers anymore. And that that suspension of visits happened a few different times and for long stretches. So far fewer providers of transportation to the facilities existed. And, Bef and most of the, a lot of these facilities are very far away. Correct. So pre-pandemic, they had at that time around 52 facilities and there was this whole network of van companies that would pick up people at various places throughout the city. The, to the unknowing, you would have no idea that this space on the sidewalk was a place where around 10 o'clock at night, people were gonna start gathering with large bags, care packages, to take to the facilities. And they were gonna be riding those buses through the night for a visit. So we would go to those places, because we were part of the network, and provide hand warmers and toe warmers for people because it was cold, most of the places they were going. We'd bring snacks, and during the holiday season, we'd bring um, children's books and gift um, toys, gift wrap for children. So, because a lot of people were bringing children, and for that long ride, they would have a surprise and a, a, and a gift. And we'd also give them literature about our services, all of which are free. It's amazing, and no wonder I talked about your energy <laughs> and your commitment to this. It's astonishing and inspiring and everything else. We're talking about closing prisons, mm -hmm. and that's a whole other interesting kind of thing. But we're not talking about building new kinds of prisons, institutions, are we? Well, Did it depends upon where you are. In New York, the prison population has decreased drastically from 72,000 to around 32,000 now. But at one point, it had dropped to like 29,000. It's a state. It's New York prison. State prisons, prison. right. So with that drastic drop in population, you didn't need as many facilities. Okay. So a, a move started happening um, with a couple of prior governors to close prisons, and more than 13 have been closed. Only one maximum security prison, though, has been closed. The rest are mediums, minimums, and work release prisons. The problem with that is that what you want to do is move people from maximum security settings to more, less restrictive right. settings so that they're better able to navigate coming home, right. all right? But all, like I said, only one max has been closed. But the, the need to close even more um, exists because the prison population is so much smaller than it used to be. But the union pushes to keep the prisons open for jobs, right. okay? Why Attica should be closed? It's the most notorious prison in New York State. It is, and most notorious probably across the country, it's like known, and the atrocities that existed back in 1971 when there was, when there was a rebellion in Attica prison still exist today. Terrible. Other than that, <laughs> it's a bad idea. And Attica's not the only prison that should be closed, but it's, you gotta start someplace, yeah. we're starting there. Have you ever been to Germany to see what they, their prisons? I did not go on that trip to Germany, yeah. but I'm very familiar with their yeah. system. Yeah, and it's nothing like this. No. It's, it's like a home. Right, the same department. in Scandinavian, many of the Scandinavian countries are the same. Right, they don't wear uniforms and they, right. and they live in a decent kind of house. They treat it like people. Right, so are we ever gonna resolve we're not going to be able to resolve um, Rikers without strong federal intervention or takeover? Or At this point, it does then? seem like that. Yeah. It does seem like that. And, um, you know, I think we're at a place where whatever it's going to take, it needs to close. The atrocities that happen at Rikers every day are unfathomable. I have previously served under previous administration as part of the transition team to try to shut down um, Rikers and go with a borough-based plan, which wasn't perfect, but it was light years better than the current system. And right now, I think we're stuck in political inertia. So are you um, filled with energy? I mean, with every optimism? Day. You I'm filled with energy every day. Optimism some days. Some, <laughs> but do you think that we're ever going to bring major improvements to communities and we don't have to worry about 
the poverty and the that's what's so overwhelming. You know, there's um we need another program. We need a major lobotomy of the American psyche yeah. so that we shift from thinking that we're better if some people are worse off and that we change to thinking that as a society we're better if everyone is better. If we feel more communal and more um, attached to all of the occupants of this country as opposed to just a few, just the people who can afford to live next to us, but not the people who cannot afford to live next to us. I know that's a double negative, but everybody understands what I mean. Have you ever had a sense of wanting to be involved more in the political part of running things? I mean, you mean like whole you, political office? Yeah. Why would you be mayor? Absolutely not. I don't mean <laughs> I don't mean in the criminal justice area. Mm -hmm. I mean overall because I think you have a unique perspective on what the world should look like. Anyway. I probably do have a unique perspective. <laughs> I at this stage of desirable life, and desirable. Running anybody's city is not on my list of things to do, too bad. but I'm very invested in trying to inspire other people to do that. Yes, I can tell that. That's what the whole program is about. It is. It is. Well, thank you so much, Sophia. Thank you for having me, Ron. <laughs> it was lovely. <laughs>